Jeffrey. He says, Beast from the East Live is one of the greatest displays of guitar work ever. You clearly steal the show. What are your memories of that tour in Japan? Could you feel at the time what you guys were doing on stage was so special? Well, I, th I think Beast of the East captured the kind of the apex of Dawkins' ability and all the years and years of touring we'd done. And that was recorded at the very tail end of the longest tour that we ever did. After all those, you know, dec that decade of touring, um, we'd done some massive tour, which was like this, I think it was Aerosmith in the States and then somebody else in the States and went to Europe with ACDC and then we went to Japan. <laughs> And we were just, we just didn't stop. It was crazy. And um, we were starting to, the fatigue was starting to set in, I think, you know, mentally and everything else, physically and stuff. But we hadn't quite broke down yet. And I think that was the apex of our abilities as a band. I think we were at the top of our game right around that era. So I was I'm glad we recorded it. You know, it really is a testament to what a band can do uh, if they put put the work in, you know, because quite honestly, when we first started out, we <laughs> weren't that good and we just kept working at it. You know, we were very uh, self-critical, you know, so and we knew our weaknesses and our strengths and we tried to, you know, work at improving ourselves as a band. We would go out every night uh and watch the headliner because we basically opened up for everybody else we, we weren't a headliner yet and uh we would always try to figure out the mechanics of why the headliner was the headliner we weren't you know and we'd go into the weeds and we'd try to figure it out and just make little improvements every night we listen to the board tape we discuss it we talk to our sound man we just kept trying and trying and trying you know, when we finally got our chance to headline a little bit, we were ready, you know, we were really very hungry for it. Yeah, it's you fascinating know? to hear, actually, because you don't often hear about bands, um, almost a thought process behind something like that, because a lot of bands you hear about, especially from those kind of days, it was all excess, so kind of go on stage, do your party thing, and then go off and go and drink and do this. Like. So for you guys to have put that much thought into it and be premeditated in terms of watching and learning that's that's quite interesting to to hear that kind of thing went on well we did the other thing too we, yes. <laughs> yeah we're a very well balanced band yeah. <laughs> uh yeah we did both um but uh yeah i mean we, we were at the at, at the end of the day we were very serious about what we were doing i mean we you know we, we had this kind of vision of what we wanted to be and what the impression we wanted to make on people, physical impression we wanted to make on people live and, and you know, and, uh, you know, we were hungry and we wanted to be the best band in the world. And um, uh, it was just, uh, you know, we got to the point where we kind of reached a peak where I don't think we could have done much more with what we had to work with, if that makes any sense. And uh, and we captured that in a moment, you know, on stage, which was pretty cool. Did you know you were going to, was, again, was this premeditated to record this and put this out as an album, or is it just something you did off the cuff? Yeah, no, it was, you know, they had the recording trucks and everything. We recorded, I think, two nights, make sure that we had it. I can't, it's been a while. Uh, but yeah, no, we, it was all intentional, and it was, you know, uh, there was a lot involved in that. Yeah. Good stuff. We'll talk about that being pro probably the apex. He might have answered this next question from Corbin Shields. He said, uh, uh, "What would you consider to be your defining moments in Dokken, both musically and personally?" Defining moment? Um, man, I, I'm sorry. I wish I had a, a good answer for you. There, there really wasn't. I don't think that I can think of a moment. I mean, Dokken was uh, our our that whole docking experience was really just an incremental by degrees thing. Everything was so gradual, you know, our getting signed, you know, we got signed to a little label in Europe through a publishing deal we had in Germany, which led to a record with a record company in France. And then the record came out just in a limited way and it didn't, and it failed. And then it got picked up within the next year 
by an American company, and then then we got dropped from that company. <laughs> And then we got re-signed to it later on down the road. So it was just this incremental thing. We started out touring very slowly in Europe, and then we kind of built up and got on better, better shows. Then we got big management, and that was okay. I would say that actually, thinking about it and talking about it, when we got Q Prime Management, Cliff Bernstein and Peter Minch to manage us, that was probably the one biggest factor in our success. I will say that because they managed. And Queensrÿche, and I don't know how many other giant bands. You know, they were the biggest management company in the world, yeah. and they really believed in us, and they would not take no for an answer. And I think they took a mediocre band and made us a huge band because they were who they were. <laughs> so they could get us all the radio stations, and they could get us on all the tours, and they got us all the publicity. You know, and got us great record deals, and had us fire on all cil- on all cylinders. So I would give the credit if I had to give the credit to any one entity for our success, it would be Coupon. Fascinating again, fascinating. Um, the next one is from Mike Pajowski or Pajowski, I think. Uh, he says, "I was a huge fan of Dokken, but the first Lynch Mob album, Wicked Sensation, blew my mind. Been my favorite record ever since." Two questions: What are your feelings towards the album all these years on, and how did you talk Only Logan into joining Lynch Mob from Viper? Well, I answered the, the, the last part of the question first. Uh, we were on this kind of worldwide search literally for you know to create the best band in the world and um and to find the best guys and the singer being the key guy was the most important element so we had feeders out we were looking we're looking and and uh i got this cassette with oni on it uh i think it was uh uh, yeah he was in ferrari i believe and uh he wasn't Ferrari. and um so yeah this this this, it just it was him and ray gill that was the two guys i wanted and and uh, we're kind of back and forth with Ray, and finally Ray told me, "Listen, I'm, I'm, my band is my family, and I, I can't, I can't leave my guys." And I appreciate that because I feel the same way, and I respected that. So I said, "Okay." Um, so I went after Oni, who was my second choice, and uh, we were all based in Arizona, and Oni was in California playing a show at the Whiskey with Ferrari, and we all flew out to LA like a gang and we were going to show up and get our singer. It was really funny. And they knew we were coming and Wendy Dio managed them. She was there and they were ready for a war, a rumble. It was funny. And so we watched Oni, you know, we watched him play. Oni was great. Went backstage. It was there backstage. We're all dressed up in our, you know, early lynch mob clown suits and everything, big hair. And uh, I think the hair was coming down actually a little bit by then. And uh, when Oni came in and Wendy was standing there and she was, ready for a fight she was uh, yeah she was not nice and uh i said well my my line that was the 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 great like one-liner was do you want to you want to be in a band called ferrari you want to drive one i was really proud of that uh so yeah uh but you know the band was really uh I had the catalyst of docking behind me, you know, uh, the recognition and the machine. I kept uh, the label. The label stayed with me, which is Electric, Warner Electric. Um, I got really powerful management. Q Prime stayed with Don. And, uh, but we had, you know, the, the lawyers, you know, the, 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 the publicist, uh, the radio promotion people. We had the whole machine. And we had a, a massive record deal a 1.5 million dollar deal at that time was huge and uh, we spent every nickel of it on the band and uh, we lived pretty large and we had fun and we partied and we worked hard and uh, I put a great band together and the stuff just flowed out of that because you put all the right pieces together and then just kind of sit back and watch what's ha- what happens that's kind of what happened those songs just flowed out of that amalgam of you know musicians it was really a very natural process 
It also took a year and a half to make the record. It wasn't an easy record to make. But <laughs> we knew we it had to be a seminal record and stand the test of time and this and that. We wanted to make a timeless album. And then we wanted it to be wall to wall to where you never had to pick up that needle and go to the next track. You would just, you know. So um, I think we succeeded at that. And I think it has stood the test of time to a certain extent. Um, my One of my small regrets is that I didn't get the record done quicker before Nirvana came out and crushed everything. <laughs> but... <laughs> It happens. It happens. You mentioned uh, Wendy there and fierce managers. I mean, you had a um, a brief stint or a run in, or a, I don't know. You you auditioned for Ozzy, did you? Didn't you? Did you have any run ins with Sharon? Because I've, I've spoke to many people that have. Did you uh, ever face the the fierceness of Sharon? Oh yeah, yeah. She was part of the entourage. You know, the whole time I was involved in that camp, which is about a month, and um, she was there the whole time. You know, I definitely interacted with her. Uh, she didn't like my guitar. She said it looked like a booger because it was green. Uh, that was kind of an odd thing to be worried about. I mean, I could just paint my guitar or I have other guitars that aren't green. <laughs> yeah, constructive yeah. comment and all that, yeah. Yeah. And then they had a problem with, with my hair being short because I... Uh, but I remember Ozzy came to my room one day and... and talk to me about that but the funny interesting thing which i didn't point out to him because it would have been rude was he was bald <laughs> at the time remember that period where he was bald yeah it's like wait have you have you looked in the mirror dude well whatever again could have got a wig <laughs> but yeah so they didn't like that they didn't like my booger guitar so oh well Oh, well, indeed. Oh, well, indeed. Uh, last couple of questions. Uh, Kate first with a unit on I. She says, recently Lynch Mob played a couple of shows on the same bill as Doc. And how is the relationship between you and Don these days? Wonderful. We're old men. We don't care. And we're just having, we're out there grateful for where we are and we're having fun. And the band sounds great. Don's band sounds great. I go out, you know, Lynch Mob opens up the show. We've been doing this for a few years now. And, 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 uh, so Lynch Mob opens the show. We do our thing. Obviously, don't play any Dawkins songs. Dawkins comes out, does his thing. And then I come out at the end of the night and play three or four songs. And it's all kumbaya and everybody's happy. Yeah. Uh, again, it, the question you probably get asked a million times. And Barry Werner, Hugh Collins, Trash Can Taster, Harry Williams, John Dunlap, a few others. I won't name them all. They all want to know if you, Don, Jeff, Mick will ever get together and, and do something as as the Dokken. No. In a short, uh, a short version of answers, you know, uh, uh, the reason is for one, Mick has retired, sold his drums, got rid of his drums. He's not a, he doesn't play anymore. Maybe he goes and jams here and there, but, um, and he's kind of, I think for his own mental and physical health, he's just kind of disconnected from the whole world, you know, and we don't, he doesn't return our calls. It's just, that's okay. I think that's probably what he needs, needed to do. And I respect that. Uh, it's sad in a way because, you know, we're friends for decades and built something together. We came up together, you know, it was Mick and I before anybody else, before Jeff or Don. So, um, yeah, that's, but I would love to still be friends with them, you know, maintain a relationship, but you know, that's all right. Um, but, uh, you know, Jeff has been in, I think, foreign for, I don't know, maybe 15 years. Yeah. Doing very, very well keeps them very, very busy. And um, we do our side things, you know, different, you know, like the end machine, yeah. which we're working on right now. And um, other projects, the heavy hitters projects, we do that together. We live down the street from each other. So we're always working together. We love each other. And we always dream of kind of doing something else band wise that we can take out on the road and kind of do that whole dock and building the band process again, even at our age, we, we talk about that and hope that we'll be able to do that someday. Um, but doing it in the, in the context of Doc, and I think that ship has sailed, and I said in other interviews, because um, we've tried so many times to put it back together, and it's like Humpty Dumpty. Uh, Don's got his thing with, you know, he owns a name. He's, he's hired gun guys that are great, and, and he's very happy with that, and they've been together for a lot of years, and they service the songs, and people dig it, and if it's not broken, why fix it? 
and you know for him to come back into the into a, a, a true band situation where everything's split up equally and he's not the king and he's not getting all the lion's share of the money i think that has something to do with the fact that it probably won't happen you know but jeff and i would probably do it but we would do it with steve brown which is mick's brother who we use in the end machine on the end machine records it looks just like mick and plays just like mick it's the younger version of mick. so that would work but i really don't think it's going to happen and uh you know, it's not. I mean, maybe if we were still in our fifties, maybe early sixties. But I'm going to be sixty-nine. Don's going to be seventy. I mean, I, I do. You, I would want to make sure that if we did that last record, it would be a great bookend to the whole yeah. story. And if it was anything less than that, I don't think it's worth doing because it would be. You know, it's rather to leave people with the the memories of the of the good stuff, like you know the first four five albums whatever they were and just leave it at that you know rather than going for a cash grab you know? well george it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you and wish you the best of luck for for everything that comes next thank you paul i appreciate it i'm sure we'll talk again soon thank you indeed thanks so much for your time take care Bye. thanks now Bye.